Good evening. Thank you all for being patient with us while we got going here. Um, but we have a lot of people watching from home, and we'll sort of explain how that's going to work with questions and such. But we welcome you. We're glad you're here tonight um, to join us for this. So um, I'm Jen Nectarline. I'm the College and Career Counselor here at Hunterdon Central. This is my 15th year here, and um, this month will be the end of my 17th year um, in college counseling. So I kind of live, eat, and breathe college counseling. I love it. Um, I would say 95% of the days I couldn't imagine doing anything else. And then there's days like today where there's a full moon and a lot of crazy going on um, with college applications and deadlines and some seniors feeling the stress, but decisions are coming in and so far so good. So right now, this time of year, I'm still very much in the thick of it with our seniors. Um, we've now passed a lot of our, our major early deadlines, but in the coming weeks, we'll see a lot of our seniors start to approach um, what is really our, our biggest regular decision deadline, and those will be with us right when we get back um, from the break. So the next couple weeks will be crazy. Um, and then in the second half of the year, as we move into second semester, I'll start working with juniors. Um, the names you see on the screen right now are the counselors that are working on the front line with your students. Um, I'd love to get a show of hands how many in the room have a student or are a freshman. So ninth grade. <laughs> Okay, point them out. And how about sophomore families, students representing a sophomore family? Great. Um, so your counselors that work with our freshman team, our class of 26, there are some of them are here tonight. Julie Blake, Jacqueline Devlin, and Linda Kovacs. Um, feel free to wave, to stand, to just, just show yourself there. Um, you've probably seen their names probably the beginning of, of uh, the school year, maybe even in summer. And they're on the front line. They're working closely with your freshmen as they go through their years here at Central. And then our sophomore team is Ann Biber, Kimber Kimberly Sweet, and Linda Kovacs. And um, Ann is here tonight. Our supervisor, um, Dr. Danielle Zurawicki. So a couple people from our counseling department. Um, the teams here are three counselors per grade level. They work really closely with your students on everything from scheduling to personal counseling, academic counseling. They'll write a beautiful and thorough letter of recommendation for your children as they approach this process. Um, and they'll certainly work with them on the post-secondary planning process. My role at Central is to be a second resource for your students, um, and that is to focus solely on post-secondary planning. So I don't work with A grade level, I serve the whole student body, but to manage that, um, I work mostly with seniors in the fall and juniors in the spring. So I receive a couple emails throughout the year from ninth and 10th grade students and parents asking to me. Um, I do refer those students back to their grade level counselor. I'll share with them resources, things like this program, some of the things that we, we gear toward our ninth and 10th graders, but usually about the midpoint of junior year is when I'll start meeting with students individually to go over their college and career plans. Um, so right now, now we're shifting kind of from senior to junior, at least in my office, and we'll start working with our juniors pretty closely next month. So that's a little bit of what I do. The other big part of my role here is planning um, and, and preparing and, and executing all of our different programs. So everything from nights like tonight to our college fair, our visits, our alumni programs, our scholarship programs, things like that. So it's a pretty busy, busy year. Um, and I, my office is on the 11-12 campus. I stay there, whereas your, your students' counselors will rotate offices every two years to kind of be more where that class is. So um, those of you that are watching from home and those of you here tonight that may not want to ask a question in person, you're going to notice at the bottom of every slide, and hopefully those of you at home um, are able to see this. It was also in an email. But at the bottom of every slide is a shortened link, a, a bit.ly link, um, the backslash there, ECP, or early college planning question. If you type that link into a browser, we've had some tests already, so we know it's working, you'll be able to enter a question. So those of you that are watching tonight from home on our YouTube um, 100 and Central live station, you can go to that link and test it out right now if you'd like, and you can put a question in there. Um, the goal is to go probably till about 740 or so with presentation slides, information, and then break and do um, about 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. So questions from the in-person audience, and I'll be watching the questions coming in through our quick um, Google form that you can access, and then we'll close our program by 8 p.m. And, and get you home. So we've done some introductions. You'll hear from our counselors a little bit tonight. So here's what we're going to go over, um, a little bit about why we're here, why early college planning is valuable. We'll talk a little bit about a, a, a timeline the, uh, for our ninth and 10th graders, suggestions on, on sort of what to do to maximize 
um, this planning process in those two years. Um, Julie's going to actually come up and talk about four-year planning and scheduling because that's done by the grade level counselors. And then you can see we're going to get into things like activities, exploring different majors and careers, and even get a little bit into building a college list, um, how to search, how to visit, where to kind of start with this process. I'll talk a little bit about standardized testing, which has been um, probably the, the greatest impact from the pandemic on the college admission process has been standardized testing. We'll talk a little bit about paying for college, but a lot more of that will come in the coming years. And then I'll give you sort of a sample of what is to come in all of our different programs and services we offer. So um, I, before I go to that, I'd like to know of our sophomore families, did anybody attend this same program last year? Um, and this is your second time coming back, so hopefully something new. Um, this is really designed as part one, um, if you will, of a three-part series. So we run an early college planning night every year. It's always been in November. We pushed it a little bit later this year to December. Um, so this is sort of part one, an introduction to the college and career planning process. Part two will come in junior year. I'm actually getting ready for that program next month, and we'll invite our 11th grade parents and students in for a program like this where we're really going to start to focus in on what needs to be done at that midpoint of junior year. All of our programs here at Central are like this, in the auditorium, live stream. So if you're sitting here tonight going, I want as much information as I can, I want to get that head start, you can always tune in. You can come grab a seat at any of our programs if you just want to hear what we're talking about with junior families. That's perfectly fine. And then we close that three-part series every September with a 12th grade college planning night. And you can imagine that that's really focused on actually applying. Um, so we, we go through that. And then we have programs here at Central that are for students who aren't going to four-year college. Um, at Central, on average, about 70 to 75 percent of the class will matriculate to four-year college. So that still leaves well over 100 students each year who are pursuing community college, trade or technical school, taking a gap year, enlisting in the military, going to work, and all of those options, we have resources embedded into our curriculum throughout the year to help those students. We bring our community colleges in. We just brought our military branches here. Uh, a couple days ago, we had our adult education polytech program here. A couple weeks ago, we had um, the other polytech program here. So we are always bringing in services um, to accommodate our students no matter what their path is after high school. It is common to hear, and sort of, it's sort of in our culture here, we're, we're a pretty college-going culture, but um, anything your student needs, any path they might be thinking about, I can't stress enough, they've got to just let their counselor into those ideas, ask questions um, so they understand what options they have. Tonight, we will focus mostly on the college process. Um, I won't get into much to specifics like community college or athletics or necessarily, you know, specific pipelines to college. Rather, we'll sort of overview the process. If after tonight you have specific questions, well, my, my child's thinking about a sport or my child um, may need academic accommodations in college, what does that look like? My child may want to transfer after community college. What does that look like? Please reach out to your child's counselor and then eventually we'll get a lot more into that in junior year. Okay, so these are the two biggest questions I get, honestly, from all grade levels, um, especially our, our seniors who may be starting this process now, you know, in December of senior year, which is not too late. Um, there's, there's some work to get done rather quickly, but I get a lot of that first question is, how do we start? So my guess is that if you're here tonight, you've got a freshman or sophomore, or you are a freshman or sophomore, and you're thinking, where do I start? I've heard about this process, or um, you know, we have neighbors, we have friends, or my oldest went through it, but it's been eight years, or I never went to college, so I don't know what to do. Where do we start? Um, so we're going to kind of address that. Where do you begin as a freshman or sophomore in thinking about this? And then the other other big question we get, a sort, of, a sort of a newer question over the last two and a half years is how has this process changed as a result of the, of the pandemic? And probably giving this program five years from now, I may not have to talk about that, but there still is a lot of impact that we're feeling as, um, as a high school, as seniors, not just, you know, here, just nationwide. There's been a lot of impact. Um, this process had to make adjustments really quickly um, to accommodate for things like the fact that students couldn't take a standardized test for several months, the fact that students couldn't step foot on campuses for up to a year, the fact that students couldn't engage in extracurricular activities because things weren't open. So those impacts have mostly 
been felt at our class that just graduated and our current senior class, but we're seeing our students get more back involved. Um, you know, we're fully back in school like we were last year. So the impact has decreased a little bit, but there's still things that I think are important to share with underclassmen. So. I'm gonna to touch on those. Again, if you're just tuning in from home, thank you for joining. Um, at the bottom of each slide, you will see a link um, where you can type it into your phone, any computer at home, and um, throw some questions in there. Are we getting anything in our sheet yet? Do we know if it's working? It's always a good idea to make sure things are, are working successfully. Nothing yet, just the test one, all right. So um, why do we do this? This program, when I came here 15 years ago, we didn't have an early college planning night, but I saw this, um, this increase of families asking about the college planning process earlier and earlier. So I, I think that planning earlier, it's not a must, I mean, but I think it goes with, with a lot of things in life. The more you put in, the more planning, the more preparation, oftentimes the smoother something can go. So when you start thinking about the process or just paying attention to things, listening to what, you know, um, other families might be going through, their, 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 um, the pros of the process, the cons, um, getting yourself on campuses, um, reading articles, not too many, careful what's out there. The, the media has a good, uh, a big presence in this process but just even coming tonight um, just gives you an understanding of what this means. So when we start to drop little things in junior year and senior year like the Common App or applying early action or deadlines or an acronym like FAFSA, you understand what those things mean. Um, so just getting, getting here and understanding what's involved in this process will help a lot. Um, it gives you more time you know, just more time to research different schools and get out of the same cluster of schools that, that everyone seems to be looking at, and it gives more time to visit. I can't stress visiting enough. I'm a big uh, proponent of visiting, and visits were hard for the last couple of classes as campus has had a lot of restrictions, but you will find your students get busier and busier, and they start to get their own car and want to do their own thing and have their activities and their jobs and their sports and their lives and getting everyone in the car to go visit Delaware or Boston or DC on a college visit gets harder as they get older. So as a freshman or sophomore, if there's a willingness, I'm gonna talk a lot more about visiting, but if there's a willingness to visit, please start visiting. I can't stress that enough. And um, the last bullet, there's always gonna be a little bit of stress in senior year. I've seen even the most prepared students feel it because it's the first time in their life they're experiencing a deadline, things to do that are really they're in full control of, um, uncertainty, um, potential rejection, very normal. Those things can lead to stress, but I find that the more they put into it, prepping in the summer before senior year, researching in junior year, sophomore year, even freshman year, starting visits earlier, talking about it with their family earlier, just leads to a little bit less of that. So what do we need to do this? Um, I think that organization is key. Um, we've helped students find ways to get organized. After students start taking things like a standardized test, the PSAT, they may start to get a lot of um, information. Is anybody starting to get college mail, emails, mail in the post, the, the uh, mailbox, things like that? Once that starts to pick up, it gets overwhelming. So I encourage some place to keep it at home. And then I would say by junior year, it really, it really picks up. So mail in the mail box, email, um, dates start coming at you, when to take the SAT, when to come to the programs here, it starts to really build up. So some organization, a place, a master place you can keep everything at home. Um, a timeline, we're going to talk timeline and sort of, you know, things to do throughout the, the freshman and sophomore years, but those things are important. Um, Julie Blake's going to talk a little bit more about the four-year high school plan. That's a big part of this. That's, that's their time here. That's their academic path. So that's a big tool in this, is what students are taking each year and how that evolves and develops, how that lines up with what they want to do after high school. And then the last, I think, is, is critical, and that's an open dialogue. So I'm sure either there's a couple students here, either they said, we're going to this, I want to go to this, I want to learn. The parents here, maybe you told your, your student that you're coming to this, that's a good start to the open dialogue, but I find, I work, like I said, mostly with our seniors, and um, seniors come with a lot more independence than ninth and 10th graders, so some of my seniors have a total grasp on this process. Their parents are minimally involved. Maybe they're just taking care of the financial aid process. Um, but when they need their parents, they go, they talk about it, a good, healthy, open dialogue. Um, I would encourage your student parents to let them tell you what they're interested in as it evolves. They might right now go, I, I have no idea. 
I know I want to go to college, but I don't know what's out there. I don't know where to start. That's a, that's a good thing. Um, but also from parents, it's also an open dialogue about things like, you know, we, we really want to support you to go to college, but here's the budget. We really want to support you, but we'd like you to consider schools within four hours. Um, things like that, I would not hold back on telling your student early on. Um, and I will just stress that about finances. I'm going to talk about finances more at the end, but that has to be probably the toughest conversation I have with students where I find that there was, there was, um, there was a break in communication and students aren't aware of what their family can afford, the parents aren't um, as honest, or students aren't asking the right questions. So I encourage an open dialogue about all topics related to college planning, but especially finances. And that open dialogue sort of... Um, intertwines too into just readiness. Um, you know, if your student, if you go home after tonight and go, we really need to talk about this, there's a lot of information. First of all, this is, this is just information. There are no tasks tonight. There's nothing you have to do. There's no homework. Um, but if your student isn't ready to talk about this and they're in ninth grade, that's perfectly normal. If they're in 10th grade, that's perfectly normal. Um, if it's February of senior year and you still can't get through to them about college, that's probably a good time to reach out to us. Um, but I still, I have senior parents reaching out to me now, you know, I can't get Johnny thinking about this college thing, are we too late? Not really. Um, you know, we can still work on this, but I would say a good average time to really start thinking about this is the second semester of junior year. Any student who's thinking about college, and kudos to you, you for being here, before that is ahead. That's where I, what I truly believe. So if you have a freshman or a sophomore who's like, yeah, I'm into this, let's go on a visit. That's awesome. That's a fantastic start. If you go home and you ask your student, you know, this spring break, do you want to go up to Boston and visit a couple schools? They're like, yeah, sure, why not? And they're in ninth grade, you're in really good shape. That's, that's like way ahead of the game. Sophomore year, again. Junior year, if they're like, oh, all right, you know, my friends are starting to talk about it, I'm in it. That's fantastic, okay? Reach out to us with concern. If it's senior year and you know they want to go to college, I've talked about, but you're not making progress. So all of this open dialogue um, is really going to be important in making this a little less stressful for everyone. All right, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, questions, anything? Are we doing okay over there? Okay, if anybody just tuned in from home, welcome. Um, at the bottom of each slide, you will see a link that you can type in to any computer and throw in a question. So I wanna share some things that um, we, we hope to see in, in the ninth grade year and 10th grade year. So first, if you're sitting here tonight as a sophomore parent, guardian, or supporter, uh, or a sophomore student, and you're looking at this slide and you're thinking, I didn't do those things, just hear us out because chances are you did and maybe you didn't realize it. This is not really like a to-do list. These things, if your student is engaged academically, attending meetings with their counselor, these, these things are probably happening. So number one, meeting with their counselor. Um, we have a very thorough, comprehensive, developmental counseling curriculum. Um, and what that allows is for our counselors to meet with their students on a regular basis. There'll be times it's in group format, um, and there'll be times that it's individual. But counselors are cycling through their caseload and meeting with their students. So, I would encourage your, your student or students in the audience, when, you, when a pass comes to meet with your counselor, go and have a good open dialogue. Let them into who you are and what you're about. Ask questions and build that relationship. Um, those meetings will happen throughout the year. So I'll talk a little bit more at that bottom bullet about what we're doing with our ninth graders in a couple of weeks. Um, another part of ninth grade, it's going to happen for all the ninth graders, is to start working on their four-year plan. Julie's going to talk about what that is. That's a four-year plan, a tentative plan. It's a working plan. It can change of the courses they're going to take while they're here at Central. And there's a whole lot that goes into that. So I'll leave that for Julie to talk about. Third bullet, a um, little bit broad, but what that means is, is to get involved. And that's not necessarily get involved here at Central. We'd love for them to get involved here. And we have a whole lot of opportunity for that to happen. Happen. Um, sometimes I think our our amount of clubs and opportunities rivals that of a small college. I mean, our, certainly our program of studies does. Um, that's our, our course availability. So there's a lot here. Um, if your child comes home or your students are going, there's nothing. I don't think they're looking deep enough. There is a lot here, but that's not the end of it. We have plenty of students that I, I meet with in senior year who are so busy. They are doing school from 7.30 to 2.50, and then they're going out into the community, the dance studio, the martial arts studio, ShopRite, Chipotle, wherever they're working, and they're so engaged in things that have nothing to do with this high school, and that is perfectly fine. 
that is more than fine. Or they're going home right after school at the bell. They're getting on their bus, they're home because they have a sibling to get off an elementary school bus and make and get their snack and their homework and start dinner because their parents are working. So their level of engagement here is lower because they have significant family responsibility. All of that is considered involvement. Anything they do that can't fit on their academic transcript is an activity and it's involvement. So all we ask of our freshmen is find something to get involved in. If it's something you're continuing on from your middle school years, that's fine. Maybe it's a new club here. And if you just kind of, you know, dip your toe in this year and oh, it wasn't really for me, try something else. There's tons, there's tons and dozens of clubs to choose from, but just try to get involved in something or something in the community, okay? Fourth bullet, only if you're ready for freshmen is to start brainstorming. So if you know college is in your future and you want to pursue and continue your education after high school, just start brainstorming. What does that look like? Well, I don't know, if I went away to college, would I go close? Well, I don't know, I did sleep away camp for 12 summers. I'm pretty comfortable being away from my parents for a long period of time. Maybe I can look up in the Northeast or, you know what, we've got a lot of family in the Midwest and they're not going anywhere, I'll look at some schools in Michigan. That's just good old healthy brainstorming, okay? Do you have a question? Sure. So there, absolutely. Um, there's a question about college visits. I have a slide on visits, so I'll certainly address that. Absolutely. Um, so just brainstorming. And brainstorming can include visiting. It can include going to YouTube and watching a day in the life of a student at Boston University. All of that is good, healthy stuff. But if they're not ready, they're not ready. So don't push it, parents. Students don't feel like you have to do it. It's just an idea to just start brainstorming, okay? And I know there's a couple freshmen out there who probably have had this working list of schools in their heads since seventh grade. I get it. I see them as seniors in my office. They're like, I know, I've wanted to, I've, since fourth grade, I've wanted to go there. All right, you know, so we have, we've got kind of some, some extremes there, and that's fine. We'll meet them where they're at, but brainstorming's not a bad idea. Bullet five here, exploring careers and majors, kind of goes with the one above. So, you know, sometimes as kids, like I'm saying it to my own fifth grader, you'd be really good at this. Even my second grader, you'd be really good at that. We say that to kids, um, and they have no idea what that means. But, but as they get older, they start to hear that, maybe from teachers or peers or teachers when they get here, and, and just kind of looking into what that means. Uh, people say I'd be really good at engineering. I'm good building and creativity. Or people say I'd be great, you know, um, in the music industry or great in healthcare. I'm very nurturing and I, or I'd be a great teacher. My teachers tell me that. What, what, a, what a beautiful um, honor to be told that. So just investigating what that means. And I have a whole slide on exploring careers and majors, but again, just getting the wheels turning in freshman year. The next bullet, again, if there's a, a willingness for that open dialogue and there's a readiness to start talking, sit your children down. Students ask, you know, what, what can we afford? Are we talking about an in-state school? Are we talking about community college and then transferring? Is there a budget for me? Is there a savings for me? I ask for your honesty there because we see those students in March or April of senior year who have acceptances to a boatload of great schools. They got a little bit of money, maybe some merit scholarship, maybe no need-based aid, and they're sitting and looking at 10 admission offers with an average of $60,000 a year tuition, and their parents told them then, we can't afford that. So those are conversations we ask you to consider having earlier than senior year when decisions have to be made about what, what is affordable. We have a financial aid night here every fall. You can watch previous year's financial aid night on our website if you really want to go into that process. But I just ask you to consider having a little bit of open dialogue with your student about college finances and students to ask questions. Um, and then the last bullet, this is coming up. So. Um, I'll, I'll kind of preface this with, here at Central, we have been using a program called Naviance for uh, my 15 years here, plus a couple more, almost 20 years. Um, Naviance has been the premier college and career planning software program around for a long time. And then, of course, new programs develop and competitors come out. Um, we are going to be ending our, um, our, our contract with Naviance in the coming year or two. That is not definitive if it's going to be um, this coming year, uh, this coming summer, or the following summer. Um, but what that means is our current sophomore students, and of course our juniors and seniors, but our current sophomore students have access to something called Naviance. They were introduced to Naviance um, in December of their freshman 
freshman year in this very room. And if they're thinking, what, Naviance, what? We, were, we saw them by, um, by gym class. Our PE department worked with us, and we saw the entire freshman class in two days right around this very time last year. So when they were freshmen, they got introduced to Naviance. And I know some have used it, but now they're sophomores, and they will have access to Naviance at minimum through August of 2023. Um, we have been watching this new program called SCORE. That's what you see on the screen, S-C-O-I-R. It's pronounced SCORE. Um, we've been watching SCORE for a couple of years, um, and SCORE has been, in our eyes and in many schools' eyes, the most premier competitor to Naviance. In fact, in some cases, a little bit more intuitive, a little more user-friendly, and we attempted to go with SCORE right before the pandemic and halted it um, as we were going through that. We didn't want to try to introduce something new, not only for students, but for staff, um, but we are now going full on 100% with our implementation. So our current freshman class will not be getting introduced to Naviance at all. Um, they are going to be the very first class to get full use of SCORE. And SCORE is going to be introduced to the freshman class on December 19th and 20th right here. So it's a Monday and Tuesday, the week leading into break. Um, we're going to see our entire freshman class through PE classes again. So we're, I think our counselors have been telling them, I'll be sending an email out to freshmen next week. We'll get something out to parents um, about what to look for leading up to those groups. So SCORE is, um, after years of research, an incredibly intuitive college and career planning program. We're going to show you a little snippet of it in a couple slides, but um, that's coming. So we're going to get a whole block with freshmen. I'm going to get a chance to meet freshmen. The counselors will get to see their faces again as we approach that, um, that midpoint of the year. Um, and we're going to see them in December. We'll spend a whole 80-minute block with them. We'll do half the block getting them registered for SCORE, and that will be their SCORE account for all through high school, and it will be the pipeline between them and applying to college. Um, and then we'll spend the second half doing a little bit of an early college plan lesson, kind of a mini version of tonight geared just to freshmen. So it'll be a very full 80-minute block, December 19th and 20th. If for some reason your student misses PE that day, we'll run some makeups after the winter break. So that's ninth grade. In a nutshell, hold your questions. We're going to take a bunch of questions at the end, but that is what we'd love to see of a freshman, um, is, is getting through some of these things. And again, there's no homework, there's no tasks. These are just things to think about. We're going to shift here in, oop, into sophomores. So you're going to see a lot of things continue. Again, tuning in from home, there's a link at the bottom. If you have questions, throw them right in, there in our Google form. Um, tenth grade, again, continuing meetings with the counselor. So these, again, are embedded into the year. They're going to have opportunities. They're going to get passes from their counselor. Again, there might be groups. There might be individual meetings. But they will see their counselor's face. And, of course, they can, they can request a meeting with their counselor anytime. Um, but they will be meeting, continuing to meet with their counselor, continuing to update the four-year plan. So now it's an evaluation of how they did freshman year. We're coming up on scheduling. Julie will talk about scheduling. Scheduling for next year, um, so for what will be sophomore or junior year for your kids, um, is going to happen in February. So we're, we're going to be at that point soon. So they'll start to think about how things are going in freshman year, what the student was recommended for for sophomore year, and start to continue that, uh, keep building that four-year plan. Sophomore year is a good time to evaluate the activities. So what did I do in freshman year? What did I like? What did I not like? What am I trying new this year? And it's really a continuation. Nothing has to be set in stone. I do think there's probably plenty of sophomores who are really engaged in things and they found their thing or they've been dancing since they were four and they're still dancing or whatever the case might be. But this is a good time to sort of evaluate. How much time do I have? Am I going to have less time as I take more rigorous classes? What do I still want to sort of try out here at Central? Just the evaluation of their activities is important. Um, considering this is kind of late now because we've already had the PSAT, but um, the PSAT will be seen again next year as for sophomores as juniors, and that would be an important year to take that practice SAT. We offer the PSAT here in October. Scores are out out. They're out. Yeah, right. It's the eighth. So um, so the PSAT is great practice. Um, for some of our students who are at the, the very, very higher end of the class, some of our students with um, taking, you know, much more advanced coursework might definitely want to consider the PSAT in junior year um, as they might be a qualifier for the National Merit um, Scholarship Program. But overall, it's just good practice. So you'll see that come up once a year each year in October. I'll talk a little bit more about additional standardized testing in a few slides. Um, again, this is the continuation of freshman year. Continue research. 
coaching options after high school. So do you still want to do the college thing? Do you want to look into the military or a service academy? Are you thinking now about a trade or a technical program? Just continuing to research. Um, if you're ready, great time to step on campus. It's not too early in freshman year, um, but sophomore year is a great time to step on campus. Campuses do not change a lot in two or three years. So if your schedule is open with a 10th grader and they're willing, start planning. Okay, you know, you're going to have windows of time and I'll talk, there was a question about best time to visit. I'll talk about that more with visiting, but if you have a willing sophomore, take them on campus and record things. And again, I'll talk about it, but pictures, notes, even videos, because in two years when they're a senior and they need to write about what they loved on that campus visit, they're going to forget. So if you are one of those families who's visiting in the underclassmen years, definitely record those opportunities. Um, considering virtual college programs, from the pandemic, so many schools had to shift to turning their campus into something really incredible through a screen. And I was so impressed with what some schools did when it came to virtual tours. You know, virtual tours pre-pandemic were like, for many schools, like still photos with a caption. You know, some schools got fancy. Well, they turned this around. They had students going around campus with GoPros. They had really advanced videos. Um, it was actually kind of refreshing to see virtual tours of students wearing masks because you knew those colleges were really investing in updating the most recent footage, and now they're continuing that. So the virtual platform of, of looking at colleges has, has in, enhanced so much. Um, this past March, um, we brought back our college fair after a two-year hiatus. We host the Hunterdon County College Fair here at Central every March. I'll share that date um, near the end. I can tell you it's March 21st. It's no big secret. Um, but March March 21st, it's a Tuesday night, we'll host our fair. We do advertise it out to all grade levels and it's a really great opportunity for sophomores to come and learn about 150 plus schools in one night. So I'll share that more at the end. Um, that second to last bullet, participating in career exploration, the, the sophomore team, you know, sophomore year is, is a year where we start to kind of focus in on, on careers and asking what would you like to do, considering the classes you've taken, the activities you've done, what's starting to become of interest. And if your sophomore has no idea, that's fine, but there is going to be an opportunity for them to engage with their counselors um, in the winter on a career exploration process. So that will be coming. Um, sophomores, again, the last bullet, sophomores have access to their Naviance account. There's nothing wrong with it. It's fully updated with college and, and admissions data um, through August at minimum. And then it might go on. I'm, we're not 100% certain yet, but sophomores will be getting on to score in January. Okay, so we're not leaving them out. We're just sticking with our curriculum that we've always introduced freshmen to a program in December. Sophomores have Naviance. They'll get score. They're going to get both of them. Um, come January, they'll have access to both. And we'll explain more of that in listservs to parents. Okay, so um, at this point, Julie's going to take over and talk about scheduling. Um, I'll be back to talk about more. But again, if you're tuning in from home, there's a link at the bottom of each slide to ask questions. All right, all yours, Ms. Blake. Thank you. Um, a couple things. I know that um, I have done this also for about almost 20 years, and it's overwhelming every time I hear it. And if you're feeling overwhelmed, I want to remind you all that the first two years of high school, all the planning you really need to do is to do high school well, do 100 and central well. And that means being intentional about your grades, about the work that you do, about developing relationships with your teachers, going to tutorial, even if not to do homework or make up a test, but to show that you care about the class, to talk to the teacher about what's going on, activities, doing those activities, even if you don't like them and being understanding what you're going to do. Remember that colleges, through the college admissions process, are trying to find out what kind of citizens you are of an academic community. The academic community you are in right now at Hunter and Central is open to you to develop that, those skills. You don't have to be perfect. They should be developing and you will get there. But that's what we're asking you to do is to be thinking about how to do it well. So that means studying, homework, talking to counselors, talking to teachers, and doing activities. Um, I also want to just point out that the coursework that you are doing here, social studies in particular, a history class, will help you and serve you through this process as well. This is really a research project. 
And as you get older in junior year and senior year, I really want you to be thinking about the skills and the, and the process that you used for a research paper. It's not unlike that, right? You're doing research, and then you're coming up with a thesis about the things that you like, and then you find the evidence and, the, and what works and what fits with that thesis that you have. So this is not unlike everything that you're going to be doing here all along. So you guys are way ahead of the game as far as we're concerned. You all know what you need to do. It just you need to recognize that you're applying your skills that you have. The first thing that we want to remind you is that grades in academic courses are going to be the number one thing that colleges are going to be looking for because that's how you're going to perform and stay in school. They are looking to make sure that you will be successful in their academic environment. That means do your classes well. And oftentimes, and I'm sure everybody here who works with students has had the question, is it better to get an A or a B in a lower level class or a C in a higher level class? And while mo every question has a, it depends, most, more often than not, it's more important for you to get an A or a B in a lower level class than it is at a higher level class. Now, there are exceptions to that. If you try an AP class and you get a C, and you know, that's great, and it's showing that you're trying. There's lots of, rule, you know, lots of exceptions to that, but gen, you know, generally, it's very important for you to keep your grades up and focus on your academics. Now, that being said, we are all going to be meeting with your children in February, January, February, March, to create or work on a four-year plan. That four-year plan is going to be um, questions of competing priorities. You all have priorities in life, right? And your child is going to have priorities. A fun class, foods, um, an easy senior year. Wow, I need a break. It's been really hard. A pr another priority that your child might have is getting into the most selective college they can. Those are all kind of competing because they may not all work together. We would like for you, with your children and you guys as students, to really be thinking about that all of that is important to a certain degree and there's a way to balance it, but you should be in con you know, conversation with us about how to do that. I don't know how many conversations I've had with students who want to take every AP possible senior year with no electives and no breathing room, no study halls. And I can tell you, invariably, every senior who's ever had a second semester senior, senioritis is real. Build in a study hall. Don't take every single class available to you that's the highest academic possible. What colleges are looking for are five academic units. Five academic units are your traditional social studies, science, math, English, and a world language. They expect you to take, and I, and I would say many, or if not most, colleges four years of each of those subjects. There is exceptions to that, of course. And one of the, the questions we'll ask your child or you know, to, in the conversation is, if you only want to take three years of a world language, that's fine, but you have to have a reason why you're not doing it. Is it you want to take a computer class? Is it because you really love history and you want to take, an, you know, take another opportunity? All of that is real and just and, and, and rational, right? And, you, and you, you don't need to explain it away. Colleges will understand that. But if you don't have a rationale, be thinking about all five subjects as kind of all four years. Most of you have, you know, the, the sophomores in the room and parents know that when you've done your first four-year plan, that senior year there's only a few academics that are required. I want you all to recognize that that's not a time to relax. It's your black belt year. Colleges, that's your last year before you're going to hit college level material. So we really um, are going to emphasize to you that it's not the time to slack off, it's the time to build. That leads me to another part, which is colleges don't expect you to take college level classes in freshman year. They expect you to work on your skills and each year build on that. So if you take all APs freshman and sophomore year and then ease up junior year and senior year, that is not going to serve you in the college admissions process. And when I talked about college admissions or competing priorities with your four-year planning, there is going to be a competing priority, which is um, you don't know what, you're going to think that you know what colleges are looking for, and you're going to 
maybe imbalance your life. So I'm going to suggest that when we do your four-year plans, or those of you who've already started it, be thinking about having going as most the most challenging coursework and curriculum that you can handle, but creating space to breathe. The last thing we want you to do is to have be is so have it so rigorous that you're actually your day routine is that you are barely getting any sleep because you have so much homework. And it's if you were walking in a pond and the water were up to below your nose, one cold, you know, or sickness or broken leg and the water's above your nose and you feel you're drowning. And whether it's anxiety or difficulties or just, you know, just feeling overwhelmed, we don't want that, you don't want that. Your parents don't want that. We want you so that if you have a cold and have to stay home for a couple days, that you will be, have time to make it up and be okay. All right? I really want you to think about your life as the big picture. We're in it for the long game, right? Um, rigor is different for each student. A lot of you may or may not try a college level class, but if you're in college prep classes, that's perfectly appropriate for you to be prepared for college. All right, if you can try a college level class, an AP class or a dual enrollment class your senior year, and that's the first time you're ready for it, that is an appropriate place. A's and B's are a better indicator of whether you can handle that college level work than really adding all of that rigor. Now, if you're getting A's and all of your APs and or in all of your college prep classes and it's not a problem, where I'm seeing A pluses with a student who's taking all college level, you know, CP um, classes, I might suggest it's time to try an honors class, right? It may be time to try something a little more rigorous to challenge you because we're going to be amplifying. But again, you don't want to decrease rigor as you get older, you want to increase rigor. So don't start with all of the rigor in the world so it's harder to, you know, to find the balance. Um, your transcript, it says, should support your college major, if known. Uh, you might also think of it as it tells a story. You look at your transcript, it has the, the class you've taken, it tells you the grade you've earned, and how much credit you got for that class. And it doesn't seem very exciting for those of you who are looking at it like this, but a college admissions officer is reading a whole story. If you've got an A in an AP chemistry class, that to them shows blood, sweat, and tears. Okay, they see, they see the, the difficulty of that um, curriculum and they know what your child has done. That's a remarkable thing. So your transcript has to be telling your, the, admission, you know, the admissions officers how important it is, you know, what kind of rigor your child has taken. Additionally, I don't want to underestimate the value of um, elective courses. They're very important and they're important for, for um, exposure, they're for a break, your child likes art, they need to have that in their day, it's all fantastic. There are some schools that won't use those grades in college admissions. So it is really important for your child to recognize that it's, if they have a choice between going to a tutorial for math or for um, missing some artwork, it may be better to get a B in art class than it is to get a B in that academic class because there will be some schools that will only be looking at that. The overall GPA does matter, but academic courses are going to be the most important part. And if, you've all, you know, if you have older children who've applied to Rutgers, you're gonna know that they're not gonna ask you about one elective, not one PE grade. It's gonna be all academic courses. So it's really important that grades are emphasized, you know, that, that that's what the focus is. Um, please be aware that if your child is in one level now, we have, this is the beauty of our program is that there is always room to move up or down. Let's say this class, you know, the class they're in currently is way too easy. As I said before, next year they can, they can challenge themselves with a higher level and the reverse. Let's say a child really struggles in an honors math class in freshman or sophomore year. It's okay to go to a STEM level or the, you know, STEM level down to a college prep level. There's nothing wrong with it. We are looking at foundational skills for success in college. There's no race to be won here. We want algebra skills to be absolutely down pat so that when your child is seeing their quantitative um, requirements in college, they're comfortable, all right? That's really important. Slowing down math means nothing, right, in the big picture. It means your child is gonna be successful when we go through. We don't wanna rush those things. 
And please be aware that when we do a four-year plan, that we change them a lot. Every year, your children will hear from a friend of theirs who took a class that just seems exactly right for your child because they were so excited and they know your, your, your kid and they're like, oh, take this class. You're gonna love um, honors, intro to Western philosophy. You're gonna, the teacher's fantastic. We'll, we can fit that in, we'll work, okay? Because it's really important to honor all those priorities that your children have and that, you know, that they see. Um, scheduling begins in February. Um, many of your children will be scheduling before they meet with us. They should go ahead and do what they think. If they can, please with them go through the program of studies and see what is available to them and what they might be interested in taking because when they do meet with us, we can actually go backwards, prerequisites, um, things that they need to take in advance to, to take that class. Architecture has several prerequisites if they're interested in that. Um, and obviously, if there's going to be a level change, say your child is in a math level or you know, in one class and they want to challenge themselves the next year, have them speak to their teacher first. Those of you who are freshmen and sophomore, sophomores, we'd really like you to feel very comfortable talking to your teachers about changing levels because I, I want to let you know you may have a 98% in your class and it really is appropriate for you to take an honors, but your teacher is going to be putting a recommendation in. Speak to them beforehand so that they know to recommend you for the next level. Extracurricular activities, I'm going to have, oh, you want me to go ahead? So, one of the things that Mrs. Nectarline said that was so fantastic, which I really want people to recognize, is that anything that you do outside of the classroom is as important, um, you know, outside of, you know, watching TV or Netflix all the time, and maybe video games. There's, we have an eSports club here, so that I can't even say that anymore. Um, but that it matters. It's how you spend your time, and it's how what you value. It tells a story just like your transcript. Your resume ultimately tells you what you value. If you are a lover of horses and you want to spend all of your time and you work at a barn so that you can ride horses and do all those things, that tells a story about you and it's as appropriate as talking about the story that Mrs. Nectarline saying, you know, it gave about you coming home after school and watching, you know, your younger siblings and taking care of them. That is responsibility. You honor your family. You honor, you know, it's like you are taking care of some very um, important things. Those stories are, have equal value. All right, and you should be able to tell them. I am going to share a life hack with you that I used with my own children because I am, I'm not a bad mom. I'm just a lazy mom. And what I did was I took out a piece of paper for each child when they started high school, and I wrote ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, and I put it in the inside of my cabinet. And every time somebody did something, you know, volunteered at the soup kitchen for five hours, sponsored by United Way, I put that on that year and I put the dates. Or they did, right? They, they soon figured out that's where they put down those things. It was so much easier to go in the senior year for them to create their resumes and create their list of activities. Now, on SCORE and on Naviance, there's a way to make your resume. But if you're like me, the laziest mother of all time, you will not want to go on that computer or remind them or have to, you know, do that. It's much easier to just write it on that piece of paper and then later on, you know, your child can put it into SCORE or Naviance, what's appropriate for them, or the resume building when it's time. Now, choose activities that are important to you, not everyone else. We, we do hear a lot with our students um, that what do colleges want? Colleges want to you. They want what you're interested in. They also want to know what you're interested in. So it's really okay to try a few things and not have it be right for you and to stop. I'm giving you permission to stop something that you don't really like. Find the, but I'm not saying do nothing. I'm saying you need to keep trying and finding something else. It's okay to do something you don't like as well. If you are serving others, you're volunteering, and you are working in a nursing home, and you're doing some work that's really challenging for you, but you're doing it anyway because you know that it's good and your grandparent is there, that is meaningful. You, what we want it to do is to be meaningful to you, be meaningful to your family, or whatever it is that's helpful, and for you to be able to explain it. All right, and to articulate it. And that's our job as professionals, is to remind you 
of what that you do is of value, okay? And then logging your activities, I shared my life hack. I'm sure you all are better people than I am, so I'm sure you'll have your own special way. Um, summer experiences, jobs are fantastic. Um, there are some, you're gonna get summer um, program invitations, are they worth it? Um, they are worth it for the experience. I don't want anyone under the, the illusion, delusion, that they will help you with college admissions. What they do are, they can be very expensive, so it's like if you can afford it, if you're not giving up a family vacation to do it, great. And they can help you know, your child understand a profession or understand something. But they are not going to be seen as a selective opportunity for your child that's going to help them with college admissions. It will help expose them to career and college. You know, college. So use it in terms of information. This is the time, the first two years are information gathering. There is no bad information. It can be what you, finding out what you like, what you don't like, finding out that you know, being a dentist is not for you. That's okay, it's information gathering. All right, are you ready? Is there anything else? I'd let you finish this up. All right, thanks. Thank you. Okay, hopefully you're still watching us from home. Thank you, Ms. Blake, that was great. She, she can do that really well because Julie's a veteran counselor. She's put two, two students that um, wrote their activities on a loose leaf sheet of paper in the kitchen um, through college, and they're incredibly successful and just uh, tremendous people. So, um, so great information there. I'm going to leave this slide up. I, a couple things coming in on the questions I just want to address. Yes, th this is so we're live stream, um, and this recording will be on our YouTube station. So definitely check it out. All of our programs, just know that, especially if you're a freshman family, all of our programs are recorded. You can check out years of early college planning nights, junior nights, senior nights, um, uh, financial aid night, everything is all on the 100 and Central YouTube station. A lot of stuff on there. And then there was a question that probably came in right before I said it about when saw Sophomores will be introduced to SCORE, and that's going to be in January. So it seems like freshman first, sophomore second, but it's because sophomores already have something. They already have Naviance. So um, we'll get them on in December. And then, if, you know, if you're sitting here tonight and you have a junior, you're thinking, well, when are they getting it? It's coming. It's coming for sure. It's a big, a bit of an effort to get the whole school on this new system. Um, slides, will they be made available? Yes, we'll put them on our website, things like that. So I think I've addressed most of that. Um, I want to piggyback off of something that Julie said about this slide she did a great job talking about activities but one of the questions I do get often from underclassmen families freshmen and sophomores is, is about those those summer programs so you've gotten a really shiny envelope in the mail and it's got like a wax seal on it and it's got beautiful gold foil print and it says you have been honored Jessica not picking on Jessica's but it's like very personalized and you open it up and it's trifold you have been invited to participate in and usually there's some combination of the words national or international leadership youth prestigious presidential and you get to pay $5,995 to come to us for seven days and engage in this gold foil print experience please do not to do that. Now, if there's $6,000 to spend and you want your child to engage in that, we're not going to say no, but I will tell you, as Julie said, and I will reiterate, that has absolutely no impact on college admission. None. Okay, so if your child really wants to do something in the summer um, to keep to, to impress a school, and I'm, I'm not saying this, and students listening, eventually listening later, your parents did not pay me to say this, get a part-time job. Get a part-time, good old-fashioned scoop and yogurt, camp counseling, mowing lawns job. That is never going to go out of style. That is never going to look to a college like a lesser thing. There is dependability, responsibility, um, all sorts of great attributes that come with having a job, whether you're mowing lawns for 12 homes in the neighborhood or you're responsible for 10 you know, eight-year-olds from nine to five, Monday through Friday for 10 weeks of the summer, wow, um, or you're helping your grandparents, or you're scooping yogurt, or anything like that. 
Jobs continue to be one of the most admired activities any high school student can do. And I'm not just saying that because I started working when I was 14, but I'll tell you what, it built for me a tremendous work ethic that's never gone away. And I've seen it happen in our students. And again, students, your parents are not paying me to say it. Jobs are important. Now, if your student never works in high school, that's fine too because they're likely filling their time with something else. Maybe they are heavily engaged in honor societies, leadership clubs, sports, um, their courses, after all, that's fine. But these things that come up in the summer that um, are coming with the wax seals and the big price tag, they are, they are not worth it. If, if, like I said, like Julie said, I agree. If, if you have the resources to do it and it doesn't you know, um, break apart your family calendar or interrupt a, at a family vacation because, you know, there'll be years where those don't get to happen, then, then do it. But it's not going to help with admission. It will provide some level of enrichment, but it's not going to help with admission. All right. Again, tuning in from home, feel free to put your questions in. Um, so we're going to get another about 10 or 15 minutes of information, and then we're going to start to take your questions. So exploring majors and careers, we talked about how this will be embedded into the sophomore year curriculum. Um, that's going to be coming up in, in a few months. But this is something that is just good casual brainstorming and research for ninth and 10th graders. In Naviance, we've got some fantastic career research tools and SCORE has them as well. We'll be showing those to our students. Um, this career exploration groups are coming up for sophomores. When I say career exploration and these different tools, these are like assessments. So when students go in to these websites, they'll be able to take different inventories and assessments. They may have done something like that in middle school. This is just kind of leveled up because now it's actually linking them with careers and eventually with colleges that offer the majors that align with those careers. You're going to start to see things sort of build a web here. Um, I'm going to show you two areas. This third bullet, um, you're going to hear the words college board a lot in high school. College board, not only is it one of the most comprehensive college search tools out there outside of what we use, Naviance and eventually SCORE, but College Board also runs the PSAT, the SAT, and they also run advanced placement, the AP courses. So your student, if they ever take a PSAT or SAT, will get a College Board login. If they ever um, take AP courses, they will be on, they will create a College Board account to access all of that. College Board does a really good job of, of kind of profiling majors and careers. And I think it's important to differentiate the two because they're different. What you major in in college is not necessarily your career. Um, so I think that goes for a lot of people. My degree is psychology, and granted, that was a good pathway into school counseling, but I, I'm not a psychologist. So I like to introduce students to these two separately. So college majors, this section of college board is called Big Future. Big Future is sort of the planning house, if you will, within college board. And these are all linked. These slides will be made available. But college board breaks majors down into different categories. So if we just start here in business, and it lists major upon major in business. So, you know, student comes in and says, I want to be an accounting major. Now, bear with me if I have any accountants in the audience or listening at home. But this is how college board profiles the major of accounting, not the career, the major, the four-year or more college major. So it kind of opens up with just some language. Um, are you ready to do the following? These are things they might do as a college major in accounting, um, some skills that might be helpful to have, things that might happen for them in college. You know, is there a beta alpha psi chapter that's a national um, you know, chapter, honors fraternity of accounting. These are just little things for high school students to pay attention to. Um, it spotlights different courses. And then over here, we can't ignore the right side. It has similar majors. It links them to colleges that have accounting. Okay, so this is what we call kind of the profile of a major. Now we switch over to the career, and they're different. So the students can type in any career that's interesting to them, um, but they can also do and, I, and it's late, just bear with me here. Um, they can also do searches, but they can learn about the actual career, okay? So we go in here, we might see a median income, we might see information about what kind of education they need, what kind of tasks and skills it'd be helpful to have. So all of this is on the College Board website. They're also gonna get this in Naviance, they're gonna get it in SCORE. There are so much out there. So when you're thinking ninth and 10th grade, how can we sort of start this conversation about college? Uh, Johnny doesn't even know what he wants to do, or they're not sure, they can start here and just kind of browse around and look at different majors and careers. It's just a little bit more user high school, high school student friendly than kind of reading a, a occupational handbook or something. There's a lot of good information. And again, this is all on College Board. 
all right? Um, let me jump back here. Um, another thing, if you have connections, parents, your friends, your colleagues, where your student might be able to spend a week in the summer shadowing an architect, shadowing an accountant, heading up an engineering firm to see what they're doing in civil engineering, whatever it is, get your student that real life experience. What you won't see, sometimes I'll have high school parents reach out and say, where can we find internships? Internships, Yes, there are seniors who may intern somewhere. That's sort of a, a fancy word for shadowing. Internship is a more is a more of a college term where internships lead to careers. In high school, we tend to call it a little bit more of a shadowing experience. It may be something kind of like one of those summer programs where they're really engaging in the field. But anywhere you can get your student experience, whether it's through shadowing, volunteering, a part-time job, interviewing someone in the field is all good stuff, okay? Um, and I just put this on here because I do have families that ask, you know, what's popular? What are a lot of students saying they want to study? I will say um, consistently here at Central, STEM covers a lot. So science majors, biology and chemistry, technology majors, computer science and related fields, engineering and everything that falls within it. Um, I wouldn't say I have a ton of students going into math, um, but, but it comes up, statistics, things like that, data analysis, data science. STEM covers a lot of it. Um, can, within that, you know, the biology with preparation for something in medicine, um, computer science is growing tremendously um, across all types of students. After the STEM fields, um, business is really popular, all areas of business. Um, psychology remains popular, allied health, so physical therapy and occupational therapy, um, and then nursing. The, this is what we see a lot of. It doesn't mean students don't come in and say, I want to major in languages. I have a handful of seniors studying linguistics. Um, you know, some that, that want to go into the humanities. Um, I wish we had a bell to ring in our counseling hallway every time someone said education. Um, that, that's, that's music to our ears. So it's out there. It's decreased a little bit, but there's definitely students interested in going into education, helping professions, but this is what we're seeing a lot of. So what this means is we're consistently developing lists and we're familiar with schools that, that really focus in on these majors. All right. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. This is not, not something that has to happen as a freshman or sophomore. I imagine for some, it is a working kind of in their mind. You know, eventually I'd love to apply here or look there. When we see our freshmen in, in this room in, um, in less than two weeks, we'll ask them, does anybody in here right now actually have a college that they might want to go to? And it, a, a few hands do go up. There's one, you know. They think of names, they know names. And I will tell you, and I say this even to seniors that are still kind of working on their college list in senior year, where does a college list start for most students? It starts with what they know. So if their parents went to college, perhaps where they went. If their brothers or sisters, if they have older siblings, cousins, or friends, where they went. So we first know what's familiar, what's talked about in the house, okay? Or sometimes if you went to college and your child's like, there's absolutely no way I'm going where my parents went, that's okay too. But it's a college name, okay? And sometimes those are the schools they see first. Outside of what's just familiar in, in the family and friend talk, um, usually sports plays a role. So the schools that they hear about and see about in national championships, March Madness, ESPN on a Saturday, that contributes to lists. Sports is the number one factor that makes colleges popular. So it's so interesting to see who's in the national championship, who's in March Madness. I mean, last year in St. Peter's, I don't know who else follows college basketball, but that was incredible last year. What happened with, you guys know March Madness, St. Peter's here in Jersey City, what happened with their applications last year? The little, you know, we, we think it, it's not going to impact, but it really does. So familiarity, sports, um, and then we go into these other things, like what they see people wearing, you know, the sweatshirts around school, the stickers on the car, the flags on the houses. You know, I have a student, um, I don't know the Jersey Shore well, I, I travel more down south, but I have students who say, you know, I built my college list by going around Ocean City and seeing all the flags that were flying on people's houses, and I've only been there once, but when I was there, it was like for, for a college counselor, it was kind of cool. I was like, there's so many flags, but that's a thing. People represent where their kids or where they went, and they go, that's how I started building my list. That's how I got to know know what colleges were out there, fit summers at the Jersey Shore and seeing the flag. So after that, though, I think students need, need more. They need a lot of help because that might give them 40 or 50 names. There's thousands of schools in the country. So we, we want students, when they are ready, to invest some time in searching. 
using Naviance, using College Board, eventually using SCORE to really start to build that list. And that list initially, when they start to put criteria into a search, you know, they might say, okay, six hours from Flemington, no more than 20,000 students, no more than 35K a year, must have these majors. Oh, I think I want to play this sport. And they get a hit list of 400 and go, well, how do I narrow this down? Well, put a couple more criteria. You start to get that number down, you bring it to your counselor. And I'm not talking about this right now. If they're ready, that's great. But eventually, this is how we start to narrow down. So it starts with what's familiar, and, and, and then it grows from there. But you will hear us over the years say names to your students. They might come home and go, you know, Mrs. Nectarline recommended this school in Connecticut. I've never even heard of it, but it starts with a Q. And I can't spell it or pronounce it, but she said it's going to be a good fit for me. Please trust us. We get to know your kids. Your counselors get to know your kids so well. And as they get to junior and senior year, if we start making recommendations of schools, there's something behind it. We think it's a good fit academically, personally. We know your kids. Students have said, I, I really need scholarships. Who doesn't? These are schools. We're going to give you names of schools that give good merit money. Um, so just, just keep that in mind. So there's a lot that goes into building a list. Eventually, as seniors, we want students to have a good, healthy list. So you're going to hear these three terms a lot if you keep coming to our programs over the, over the years. Probable schools. Um, if you went through the college process, parents, um, at, you might have heard this term safety. A safety school, safe ad chance of admission. We don't use that term. I think safety is, is an unhealthy term to use because there's nothing safe in college admission. There's no guarantees. But probable schools are schools where students have a high probability of getting in. So that means that over time, their overall profile, their GPA, their rigor, their test scores, if, if they're utilizing them, are above that of the admitted student. Or, based on our guidance and our advice, we have a good, strong um, belief that they'll be admitted. Target schools match up really well with them, and then we have reach schools. And I'll be honest, that, that tends to be where a lot of lists start. Um, and that's okay. Our, our job is to get students into a realistic, healthy place with their college list. So an even number even number of probable target and reach. Not 70% reach to set us up for most rejections and a handful of probables that we really don't like. We just want to get into it. That's, we got to squash that and we will need your help squashing that because that's not uncommon. And that's just not here. That's everywhere. So that's something we work toward as we get to senior year. But a good, good blend of schools, and we will coach and guide your students on how to create that good blend as they get closer to junior and senior year. Um, I just put this here because I get the question all the time, how many, student, how many schools should, should students apply to? It's, it's up to them. Whatever a healthy list is, and for some students that's four schools, for some it's six, for some students applying to really selective majors, it could be 14. But I run a report every year, and it's usually nine point something. Um, so usually about nine. And what that does is it gives students about two to three, two to four schools in each category. So a couple probables, a couple targets, a couple reaches, a couple. Okay, so you see where I'm going with this. The, the issue we consistently, we consistently have is too many reaches. So about nine schools, and again, less is fine, more is fine. Um, so again, we'll get to this point using Naviance until we have it, um, eventually score. I'm going to show you what those look like. We'll use college admission profiles. So what the average, so that stuff is out now. It usually comes out around September or October. The current class that just came into the college, what they look like coming out of high school. So if you go to pretty much any college's website to the admissions page, you'll see the entering freshman class, their overall stats. Keep in mind that's always going to be slightly inflated from our average stats because that's a global picture. That's everyone who came into that freshman class from all states, all countries, territories, it's everybody. So you might go to a school, College X, and it'll say the average entering freshman had a 4.1, top 10% of their class, and a 1380 SAT. And then you'll jump over to Naviance or score and go, well, that's not what they look like coming from Central, it's lower. Yes, because it's inflated when you see it as the full picture students are evaluated in the context of where they come from, so in the context of Central. So I like the admission profiles for families to look at those to gauge where they stand, but you're definitely going to want to use our software, Naviance, and eventually score first, okay? And of course, our help. Uh, where do we start with thousands of options? You just, you, you, you search, you use the tools, you break them down, and, and you seek out our help. So how do we do this? I'm going to take you on a very brief tour, not tour, I'm just going to give you a little, a little snapshot. So again, 
sophomore families only, sophomore students only have this right now. Um, freshman families are going to get score, which is essentially the same as Naviance. So I'm going to show you that in just a minute. So this is just a kind of my, my dummy Naviance account. There is so much in here. So sophomores got this last year. If your sophomore student looks at you and goes, Navi what? So they've got it. They all have accounts. So just, just inquire and nudge a little bit. I'm just going to take you to a college's page, okay, in Navion. So I'm just going to pick um, Hofstra. It's a school in New York. All right, there is a ton of information in here. You can go right to their, their official website right here, um, but this is the Naviance page, okay? Study, student life, admission costs, all kinds of neat sort of interactive things, really neat for high school students to look at. But I want to show you the admissions tab, okay? Some basic information up here, pretty relevant for seniors. But if we go down here, you can go sophomore families into any um, college in Naviance and you can get our admission data, okay, for the last couple of years. So this is the current senior class. This is nowhere near complete, and it won't be complete until July. This is active. I like for, I, I leave it available. I have the option to turn off the current senior class, but I like for um, juniors, sophomores, you know, to see this information. So right now we have 14 active applicants to Hofstra, but let's look at last year. We had 16 apply from Central. This is just our high school. 13 were admitted, so we have a really good admit rate with Hofstra, and we sent one student. Okay, we have this going back years. Okay, now sophomores can see where they sit on a plot here called a scattergram. Okay, these are these same kinds of graphs will be available in score, um, and they can see where they stand. They're that blue dot, and and freshmen wouldn't even be on this scattergram because they have no GPA yet. They have a 0, 0.0. They have no test scores. But here's a sophomore, a junior, or a senior with an 1160 SAT and a 3.42 weighted GPA. So when they see themselves on that plot, because we enter their, their um, like we extract data from Aspen, GPA, and all that, and we put it into Naviance and eventually score, they can see where they fall, okay? And this is really good for a freshman, sophomore, junior to be doing. They can see I've got a pretty good chance of getting in. I'm surrounded by... Um, I'm surrounded by a lot of green checks, and you can look at the key down here and see. So I could spend a whole program doing this for, for you guys. I'm sure some of you may race home and check out Naviance and see, but you can do this for any school. And that's just a snippet of what Naviance has. There's searches, there's acceptance history, and career, all sorts of career information. So the question, yeah, the question just for those at home, do parents have a login? Parents can use their student's login or they can request a parent account with their counselor. But I will say with the shift to score, we're, we're talking about getting all of our parents' score accounts and score essentially does, does the very same thing. Sophomores currently have Naviance, yes. Yes, juniors have Naviance and seniors are living in Naviance. So score, um, I'm not going to demo score tonight, but I am going to show you a very brief video just so you can see what score is all about. And if all goes well, you should be able to hear this. It's just under two minutes. It worked. Okay. This is what we're getting. We're getting score.
So um, it's been around a few years, um, and I'm going to be completely honest with you. I, I, was, I, I was watching it for many years, going back to like 17, 18, and we have used Naviance here for so long that um, it was a hard break up, and we haven't broken up yet. It's, it's coming, though, and I'm preparing myself for it. But Naviance was the premier tool. SCORE came along. Um, there's other ones out there, but I, in all honesty, was waiting for other high schools to work out the kinks. I just wanted other high schools to figure out what it needed to do, how it needed to change. The, one of the biggest things we use Naviance for right now is getting um, something like 6,000 documents to colleges every year. So Naviance is, your students will apply to college in senior year through an application on their own, but we have to send transcripts, letters of recommendation, all sorts of official school documents, and Naviance is the driver of that. So I needed to make sure that SCORE was 100% on board, participating with lots of colleges. They're participating with over 1,000 schools now, and I let my colleagues at other high schools figure that out for a couple years. So now it's our time <laughs> to join SCORE, and it, it really is, a, we're not taking this transition lightly. This is, this is a significant program for the development of post-secondary planning at, at, at Central. So this has not been a, an easy or light decision as my, my colleagues know. But it's going to take us some time, and there's going to be snafus, but um, we're really excited about using it. So, um, so that's coming. You'll be getting a lot of information about, about SCORE from us. So um, it does exactly, though, what Naviance does, that those college comparisons. And all of our data is currently in process. We're putting 14 years of back admission data from Naviance into SCORE. So that's all in process right now. If you are a, 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 a person who likes to read and hold books, I love books by Edward Fisk. You'll, you'll recognize Fisk's books because they kind of have a lime green look to them, lime green and blue. I have a ton of them. Um, so if you're someone who likes to read books, books about college planning because you're doing this whole searching process as a ninth or 10th grade family, definitely check out Fisk, College Board, Naviance Score, and I think Princeton Review does a nice job too of college search. You could go to Google and type in college search websites and you will literally get hundreds and hundreds of hits. I really encourage you to stay focused on no more than three to four search engines. So College Board, Princeton Review, obviously our software, a few books. Um, you may come across a website called CapEx, C-A-P-P-E-X, very reliable, niche, N-I-C-H-E, reliable. We'll get some of these on our website. Some are there, um, but you can get lost very easily. And don't forget about the official college websites, the .edu's. You know, I was just showing you earlier, Hofstra.edu, Rutgers.edu, PSU.edu. The official college website is where the official information lies. So don't forget about those as well. Um, I get questions all year long from all grade levels about college rankings. So really well known, you'll hear US News and World Report rank colleges every year. I will tell you, I have families who ask me every year, will you please send us the top 30 engineering schools in the country and tell us Johnny's chances of getting in. Um, I will have to write back to that family in all honesty and let that family know I do not use rankings. College rankings have no place in this process. Those top 30 schools will be the most selective schools, not in the country, but across the globe. We are not going to work with those because those top 30 schools will likely be reaches for the vast majority of students. So we've got to really put the rankings aside and focus on fit, a simple three-letter word, fit. And I will talk about fit a lot more in my junior college planning night next month when we bring 11th graders in, and we will be seeing our 11th graders in full block groups in January, and we'll talk about fit. But if I can if I can get a little fit into your mind now, this is about fit, where your student will be happy, where they will thrive, where they will be met with healthy challenge, where they will take risks, healthy risks, not a place where they are going to drown in their sorrows of books and academics because they just got in by the skin of their teeth. They're carrying $200,000 worth of debt while they drown in their academic sores, and they're miserable, and then they transfer out, and now we've got money wasted, time wasted because they were so focused on prestige and ranking. There are absolutely students here, Julie touched on this a little, who have the goals of an Ivy League, a super selective school, a, a big name, and, and we will support them in that. We will help them get to that as well as we can, but ultimately, when you are talking about colleges with an admit rate of less than 10%, it's virtually, it's virtually impossible. I'm just going to be honest with you. And They belong on lists for some students, a third of the list, um, but it's getting our students to understand that there's more than eight Ivy League institutions in the globe. 
And, and that can be a tough thing sometimes. But I, I ask you to please not consider rankings. If you want to open up U.S. News and World Report and just see what's in there, what's going on with colleges. But the best engineering program, the top 10, are the top 10 for your student not the top 10 that are the toughest in the, in the world to get into. So we will talk about that a lot more as the years go on. Um, down to visiting, we got that great question about visits. So visit when your student's ready. If you're dragging them in the car and you're pulling them out of the car and they're you know, miserable walking around campus and the hoodie's up, it's not time. It's too early, okay? It's too early to visit. When they sit down and go, you know what? I wouldn't mind seeing Rutgers. Or let's take a drive down to Delaware and check it out. It's not too far. You know, on vacation this summer, we're going down 95. I mean, the amount of colleges in that corridor. You know, if they're ready for that, do it, okay? Time of year. Time of year is when you can get there. Um, you do it when you can get there. Families are busy, working parents. I, I get all of that. Um, you will see that, I'll, I'll share a couple things. Um, in junior year and senior year only, so this is not for underclassmen, but it's something for you to keep in mind, students get three excused days to visit colleges. Excuse. They just got to get a note from the college. It's like getting a doctor's note. That's junior and senior year. So for freshmen and sophomores, consider days we have off. So days like in-service days where we're here and they're not, you know, a random Friday or a Thursday. Um, I will tell you a pretty popular time to visit colleges has always been the November Teachers Convention, only because it almost never conflicts with a college break. Um, so that's really something to keep in mind. The upcoming winter break is tough because it's December 8th here and a lot of colleges are going to go on winter break very soon, if not already. They're quieting down for finals and they're going to be shut down most schools for about three or four weeks. So you're not going to get to a lot over the holidays. But then it starts to pick back up in mid-January. So you want to look at long weekends. You want to look at days we have off and colleges don't. A lot of colleges take spring break in March. Most high schools take it around Easter or April. Just check the college calendar. You book visits by going to the college admission website. It's going to be very apparent. Visit us, plan a visit. And a lot of times, most schools have tours happening almost on a daily basis, a 9 a.m. and a 2 p.m. What you might want to look for if you're like really interested in this school, your kid's really interested in it, you're all gung-ho and ready to go, you might want to plan your visit around something called an open house. An open house is going to be a level up from your standard tour. So when you go online, you register for a tour, it's usually a 60 to 90 minute walking tour. Um, and then you register for an information session, which could be 30 to 45 minutes, and you're there two hours, okay? An open house might be a full day event. So they're bringing out everything. They might have some food for you. They may have multiple presentations. Parents go this way, students go this way. And it's like a, a five, six hour, maybe a full day event. Those happen every so often on campuses. Fall open house, here's two dates. Spring open house, here's two dates. So you might wanna start looking at those in the coming years, if your student is really interested in a school, um, you might see those narrow in. Today's the engineering open house, full day of engineering. Parents are going here, students are gonna go here and shadow a class. So the, the visit options are, are plentiful. I will say some 2023, I've already started looking and talking with students, some 20, 2023 visits aren't even posted yet on some college websites, but if your student is ready to start visiting and you know that this coming spring break I would not wait because spring breaks are incredibly busy times on college campuses for visits and they will max out and close out tours. So just to give you a heads up, like if you know in January, we're gonna, we know this is spring break, we're not traveling, we're visiting colleges, might, might be common for some sophomore families, start planning that out in early January or as soon as that school opens up, okay? I can talk about visiting a lot more, but I will just say this and I will, again, if you wanna listen in to junior night, if you're really thinking ahead on this process, please try to plan for a little extra time on campus to do what I call go outside the script. Okay, so when you go on that tour and there's someone walking you around, that is a very heavily trained student ambassador. They're either getting paid for that or they're getting credit for that, but that is a very prestigious job on campus to be a tour guide because you are selling that college or university. They're learning everything from the ins and outs of that school and how to answer your toughest questions, especially parents, okay? So it's a script. Okay, you'll get some pretty cool tour guides and you'll get some that aren't. And they, that can sometimes make or break a college visit. So can the weather, but know that it can rain all the time. All right, so just know that that is a scripted tour. They've, they're told what to show you, how to show it to you, where to take you and where to not take you. 
That college campus could be all yours when that tour is over. You can walk through the student union. You can stop a random student and say, hey, you know, hey, my son over here visiting, what do you like about this school? What do you not like about this school? You can ask your tour guide, but they've been trained on how to answer that question, okay? So just know that there's a script. Now when you get in that room with, the, you know, 40 other families and they're giving you the information presentation with slides, that's all scripted. So you're getting two hours of script and there's nothing wrong with that. It's a really nice, pleasant overview of the school. But if you want to really get to the, the dirt, you know, the underground stuff, stop a couple random kids on campus, okay? Um, so, yeah, that, that's go beyond the script. Plan for, for a little extra time on campus and try not to do more than two schools a day. Anything beyond that's too much for your student. It's information overload for all of you. Um, and, again, you know, you might not get back to this school. I have seniors I'm working with right now that are applying to schools and they're getting that why college supplemental question. They're like, I saw that school spring break of sophomore year. I don't remember what I liked. I just know it was really pretty. I go, well, you can't say in the supplemental why college answer, it was really pretty. All campuses are kind of pretty. So please, students, don't be afraid to get this out. Snap a photo. You know, let your friends know you were there. There's nothing wrong with that. Parents, snap a couple photos. Get back in the car and take notes. Please take notes. Remember the tour guide's name, what they were wearing. The little things may come back to, oh, you know, two years. I remember that girl took a tour. She was an art therapy major, and she was from Denver, and the, all that stuff will start to come back, and that will be significant in the application, okay? A little bit about testing. I'm really going to start moving through this. Um, the pandemic had an impact on testing. The vast majority of schools dropped the requirement for SATs and ACTs in 2020 and 21. We saw some schools pull back and start taking scores again. Um, we have some schools that we know are going to pull back again this year, but still, most of our seniors are looking at the option with at least three quarters of their college list of whether or not they want to submit their scores. So we're not shying away from testing. I mean, students should sit for a standardized test, SAT or ACT. There's a lot more to be said about that. That's not something they necessarily need to worry about in ninth or 10th grade. There will be a very small portion of students, very small, that tend to be pretty, pretty high achieving. They're taking pretty advanced coursework in sophomore year who might sit for an SAT near the end of sophomore year. But at this point right now, I'm not hearing anything about ninth or 10th graders sitting for an SAT or ACT. Again, really high achieving. You, you know, you know who, they, who they are. They might be yours. Taking a pretty uh, honors curriculum, maybe dabbling in an AP or two, um, may want to think about talking to their counselor about for, for a later um, in administration for later this school year. And again, this stuff will all come up in future programs. Test prep, it's out there. There's all sorts of learning centers around town. Take advantage of what's free. Khan Academy, K-H-A-N, Khan Academy is College Board's number one partner for test prep. They do a tremendous job. You do not need to invest $3,000 in prepping for a test that's now optional for college admission, and you heard that here. I admire the local partners here in test prep. We work closely with them, we recommend them, but there's no reason to drop that kind of money. Take advantage first of what's free, and then see what your child's needs are, okay? A little bit about paying for college. If you wanna, if you're really into this process and you wanna get an idea based on your income and assets and wanna start plugging some numbers in and pick a school, maybe Rutgers, maybe an out-of-state school, every college is required to have something called a net price calculator, an NPC on their college website where you can plug in and get an early estimate of your financial aid. I would become familiar with the FAFSA website if you're really starting to think about college finances. Free application for federal student aid is what FAFSA stands for, and that's the application all families will fill out, not until senior year. There's nothing to do now. You can't even fill it out till October of senior year, and you'll fill it out for your student's freshman year of college. It will be an application that digs into your finances to determine what you are um, able to pay for college. Financial aid night happens every year in October. We just had it. It's available on our YouTube station if you want to watch it. Again, primarily targeted to our 12th grade families. Um, there are lots of different types of federal, um, different loans. Um, there's grants, that's free money, typically for our students who can show the highest need. And then of course there's scholarships based on every type of criteria you can imagine. Um, students will see the most scholarship money, that's merit money based on their academics, 
from what we call their probable schools, the schools where they had the best chance of admission. So best chance of admission, you have your best chance of getting money because you are at the top of the applicant pool. When students come in my office and say, I really want to get into my reach and I hope I get money, I go, well, you got to hope for one or the other. It's going to be money from somewhere else or it's admission to your reach. It's never going to be both. Getting into your reach school, that is the merit. So oftentimes you will not get into your big, big reach with a scholarship. That's, that's, I tell students, you're asking for too much. This is where we've got to come back down to reality. So when students come in my office and say, I need money, cut and dry, I mean, I, we, we haven't saved, I need merit money, I go, well, then we're looking at schools that are not going to be, you know, top tier, Ivy League, super selective. We're going to look at schools where you are admitted in the top of the applicant pool, you are going to be rewarded the most. Those can be tough conversations, but that's where the money is going to lie. So, um, so that's something to keep in mind. And then parents, I know are studying this, encourage your students to as well. What is all this going to be mean after four years? What are the career services like at the school? What are the outcomes? If I'm going to be sitting in, in some type of college student loan debt, am I going to have the type of job to pay it off? Ask these tough questions to those tour guides when you're on college campuses. You know, what are graduates doing? Oh, you're a senior tour guide. What are you doing after you graduate? How's the school helping you? Are they, are they conducting career fairs and job fairs? Are they bringing employers on campus? That's the ultimate goal here after all of this is, is over. So, all right. Um, and I'm going to take some questions, and I'm sorry we're running over. Hang with us for a little bit here. Um, so here's what we have coming up. We do a lot in our curriculum here when it comes to college and career planning. This is just the start. Obviously, meetings with a counselor are super important. Students, if you're listening, students here, parents tell your students, when you get that pass to go to your counselor's office, take advantage of it. Have good, thorough, in-depth conversation. Let your counselor into your world. You know, because th this is going to be your main advocate, your main front line on this process all throughout. Hunterdon County College Fair hosted here at Central. Um, we're really, really proud of this event. Last year was our first fair in two years. It was two weeks after the mask mandate ended, and I tell you, it took 30 minutes to get 1,000 people in this school. It was our largest fair to date, and it was such a sign that people just wanted to come out. It was a very, very exciting night. I can't remember who was there, but we were, like, on such a high all night. It was such a great night. We had about 1,000 people people. We had 160 schools down on the 11-12 campus. It will be advertised to all grade levels, even seniors, because in March, there's still seniors who want to talk to schools to make decisions. Please mark your calendar for that night, 6.30 to 8.30, March 21st. A couple weeks after that, we're going to have a really neat event. It's our annual admission panel. It's where we bring about five or six um, higher level enrollment people, deans, directors of admission. They come in and I ask them tough questions about college admission, trends, landscape. Now the students and the parents are hearing and we target um, pretty much ninth through 11th grade for this. There might be some seniors there, but they're kind of past this. But um, we advertise it to everybody to come here the people who make decisions talk about this process. And it is, I learned something. Every year we have that. It's such an eye-opening night. Um, obviously, we have tonight our early college planning night. Then we have junior and senior year college planning nights. In junior and senior year, we start to pull the students out for more college planning group sessions by day. Um, every fall, we host college visits. So we just ended that in November. We hosted gosh, I think about 130 colleges for visits throughout the day. So that's open to juniors and seniors only. So sophomores, your students will get that opportunity next year to sign up for visits. Eventually it will be on score um, for colleges that are coming all throughout the day for visits um, and then financial aid nights. So lots of different programs. Um, couple of ways to keep in touch. Encouraging students to check their email daily. Um, emails that are sent to students by me regarding college and career planning are going to go out through Naviance, but dump into their central email and their Naviance inbox and eventually score. So students get things in their, in their software, their, their score or Naviance inbox, plus their school email. So they can't miss it. Parents, obviously, always checking your listserv. The Hunterdon Central website has all of our college and career information listed on it. All of them, everything for seniors, for juniors, early college planning. Um, we've got our, I think I'm frozen here. We've got our financial, I am, our financial aid night. There we go. Financial aid night, um, link to Naviance here. Eventually will become a link to score. Um, all of the videos from all the programs that we've ever done. There's me standing at the podium masked. So um, very real. And then I do have a, a, a work um, Twitter account. You can kind of follow me. It's just me, you know, going to different conferences and things like that. And my, my 
my travels and in college planning. So, so that's that. I know I'm over, but I am going to go ahead and take a couple of questions. I'm going to see what's come in. We're going to continue the live stream um, for probably, you know, through our questions. Um, again, though, please, please use your resources. Your counselors um, are here to help. Um, I hope tonight th this shouldn't be overwhelming. There's no task for any of you leaving here. It's just information to kind of tuck away if you're not ready and then when you are, pull it out and kind of piece it apart. What can we do? If you get on a college campus this year, you've done something really good. If you evaluated a set of PSAT scores and talked to your student about what they're going to take next year, you are making strides. That's good stuff, okay? So um, audience, live audience here, think about your questions. I'm going to jump over here and see if I have anything coming in from home. And uh, okay, not too bad. Um, so the advantage of score over Naviance, um, far more intuitive for students. That's it. We, this was a student-centered decision. Um, this was not about what's good for, for staff. It, it, it's great for staff, but it was, it's just far more intuitive. Um, Naviance has been great. It's been a fantastic tool for us. Obviously, for many, many years, we are considered one of the highest users of it in New Jersey, but so many schools have transitioned to score for the main reason that it's just so much better on the eye for students. It's more intuitive, user-friendly. You saw some of those things in the video sometimes the students look at feel like kind of a little cheesy, but I'll tell you, some of the things I've seen that it can do that we haven't seen in Naviance are, are pretty incredible. So bear with us. This is, this is going to be a process. I'm not, a, I'm not an IT person. We're, we're working daily at this to get this, this underway, but I have no doubt by August of next year, September, we'll have everybody on and using it to its full advantage. But um, I, I think this is definitely the way to go. Um, and then I'll, yeah, I'll go back and forth. Go right ahead. Right, right. Sure. 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 So. Mm hmm. Sure. So for those tuning in from home, the question is, is focused um, around test prep and a timeline for that. So, um, and, and I'll address some other things. So testing is a very, very individual topic. Like I, I could never make a slide and say this is when a student should take the, the, the PS, well the PSAT is October once a year, you know. Um, take the SAT, take the ACT, when to prep. It's very individual. So I'll definitely encourage you to reach out to your student's counselor. Um, I will say though, a lot of students will prep after their first attempt. That's what I see mostly. I don't often see students whose families are willing to invest in test prep doing it all before the first attempt. Usually students are going to go in and take it, see how they do. Take it and take it seriously, see how they do, and then figure out their test prep there. I have families often say, you know, my student's an athlete, they're not going to have time to prep in the fall, so we're going to do a December test, see how they do, and then SAT doesn't have any tests in the winter. It picks back up in March, so they're going to prep in the winter. So I would say the, my best advice for you is to reach out to your student's counselor. Um, if We can not only recommend places for test prep, but we can recommend a timeline for that. I will say, I can't say success, but I will say most of our students reach out to Silver Oak here in Flemington. Silver Oak? Silver Oak. It's a tutoring center right behind Buffalo Wild Wings. I'm not endorsing. I'm not supporting. I'm just simply basing it on data and volume. That's where most of our students seek, seek test prep. Let me jump over here. Um, do colleges utilize students' social media accounts as an admission criteria during the application process? I haven't been asked that in a while. I'm not going to say colleges aren't going to Google your students. Um, this is something that comes up every year in our 11th grade college planning groups. Have you Googled yourself lately? 
and clicked images to see what comes up. That's something students learn in a lot of our, um, our classes too. Um, so I, I'm not going to say, I don't honestly think colleges have a lot of time. I, I remember I used to do presentations in some of our elective classes about this um, and the stat back, you know, five, six years ago. 30% of colleges are utilizing student social media. I'll be honest, after 17 years in this field, so many of my own friends, like my real friends that I, I, I spend social time with have become people in this field. So we, we talk and chat. They don't have time for that. <laughs> they're, they're so spread so thin um, in reviewing applications that, you know, checking TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram for what your kids are doing um, isn't. But it doesn't mean your students shouldn't be mindful of what is on the internet about them through social media, through other channels. Go ahead, Julie. But, but you've got to come over for our people at home to hear. She's coming. I just attended um, an event about scholarships. That being said, scholarships are going to be um, watching because they may be giving their big scholarship out and they may do a Google search of your child. So please be aware that um, maybe not the college admissions process, but if your child, if you are looking at scholarships, both media presence and anything posted. Um, additionally, emails should be clean and neat, and when they apply through, um, you know, the Common App and everything, they, sh they need to use an email that is going to be used later on because they want to have access to their scores. So there's, well, we'll have the conversations then, but just be cognizant of that. Yeah. Just wanted to say that. Yeah, absolutely. Great advice. Great advice. Um, so. A couple other things I think we've touched on that have come in um, through our questions. Again, this is, this is recorded, so it will be on our YouTube station along with all of our other programs. Is there anything else from the audience that anyone thought of? Yes, and I'll repeat it for those at home. Sure. So the question was about ranking. So 100 and Central does not report student rank. Um, when I came here 15 years ago, we had already, for many years, not reported rank. The, Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yes. So we don't, we don't rank our, we don't have report rank for students. Are you talking about our high school's ranking? Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, that, you know, I've asked colleges that over the years. Like, what do you, do you consider, like, when New Jersey puts out the ranking of public or private high schools? Um, no, they don't. So I will say this, um, and I think I mentioned this earlier when I was talking about Naviance and score and that data compared to, like, looking at the global kind of picture. Co students are evaluated in the context of where they come from. So when, when we have a, a cohort of you know, 120 applicants a year to University of Delaware, those 120 students are, are considered among each other. They're not compared to a rival school 10 miles away because that's a different context. You know, there's, there's, there might be similarities, honors courses, AP courses, lots, a whole breadth of activities, but they're a different high school. So students are considered in the context of where they come from. Um, and so I will tell you this, 100 and Central's reputation among colleges is exceptional. Uh, and I, I wouldn't, I mean, I'm very, very transparent about that. Um, I'm fortunate I get to travel around and do a lot of different things when it comes to college admission and planning. And, you know, I can think of multiple times where I had worn my name tag at a conference and people, oh, 100 and Central, it's a fantastic school. We've gotten great applicants, great students. So, I mean, I, I couldn't be more proud of not only where I work, but our students. Our students are incredible. So um, I will say, my colleagues in admission tell me that, you know, they consider things like socioeconomic factor and the scores around that. But, like, no college is looking at us and where we rank and where another school 10 miles up the road might rank. They're considering the context of what we offer, the, the rigor, the challenge. In the context of what was offered to you, what did you do with that? So in and outside of the classroom. And colleges know. I mean, like I said earlier, our program of studies rivals a small college. Within that and what all was offered to you, did you take advantage and maybe take a little bit of risk? Did you consider one of the 60, 70 clubs at your school? Did you consider the fact that, you know, around here, all the different opportunities to work part-time or to volunteer? So they consider that context more than anything, not ranking. They use ranking like I use ranking in admission. It's, it's irrelevant. Yes, question. Um, so specific channels to connect with alumni who may have gone, like from Central, 
No, but we have events here where we bring back our students from specific colleges to talk with our current students. Um, and, and honestly, it's really, a lot of it is just, it's community, you know, like, like knowing. But if, you, if, you're, if your child wanted to know students who were current freshmen, sophomores out of school, I mean, that's, that, we have all of that buried in Naviance and score. We can give names, we can give contact, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll take one or two more and then close out tonight. Sure. So the question for those at home is, is um, a question that many of us asked two years ago, is test optional really test optional? Um, so yes, test optional is truly test optional. Um, when colleges dropped the test score requirement, for some schools it was like, it was a really quick decision. Prior to the pandemic, to go for an institution to go test optional was probably for most schools a multi-year process. It was not something they decided overnight, we're just gonna get rid of this one big major factor in admission. It took years for schools to get to that point. Pre-pandemic, there were a lot of really great schools that were test optional, so they knew what they were doing. There were a lot of schools who had to figure it out really quickly. I will say, because I'm a total, the only numbers I really like in life are college admission numbers, and I'm a total data geek, I have studied this pretty carefully here over the last two admission cycles. Our students haven't fared terribly different at all by submitting versus not submitting scores. I will say, speaking of scores, SCORE, the S-C-O-I-R one, the new platform, is going to start a new feature, um, and it'll probably, we'll probably see it in a couple of months, that's going to allow students to mark on that, those graphs, those scattergrams, whether they submitted scores or not. Because right now, we look at all that data on Naviance and SCORE, and we see, okay, here's a 3-4 student with a 1,200 got into, you know, Hofstra. But we don't know if the students submitted that 1,200. Gosh, I hope they did. But you know what I mean? So we don't have that information. We only have it like through my studying of it and kind of tracking kids. Um, but I will say, at this point, because we're back to, and we've been back for at least 18 months to all students sitting for the test, we now have an option. Like we literally can sit with students and say, here's your list of 10 schools. I think you should submit your scores to these four and go test optional to these six. And I'll be completely honest, a lot of that is strategy. That, that's just trying to maximize students' chances and aid because you can absolutely get merit aid if you don't submit test scores. I mean, colleges would be in big trouble if they didn't give out merit aid because students came test optional. You can see by college, usually in those admitted class profiles, they're sharing the percent of students who came in test optional. I don't think it's hurting students at all. I think it has to be dealt with very carefully in conjunction with the counselor on whether or not submitting scores is gonna help or hurt their application. Yes, we, we work really closely with our students on it. Yes, we'll take the final question. Yeah, so for schools that don't require testing, is there something else besides essay application that they're looking at uh, sort of in place of that? Mm -hmm. or is Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I was gonna I was gonna piggyback that off off of his question. So the question is, when you don't submit scores, it's like, well, what else is important? Um, everything else is important. So the scores were this like consistent factor that colleges had, no matter what pocket of the country they came from, no matter what was offered at their high school. Everyone took the same test. So when the schools did away with that, and when they didn't have a choice because there were high schools that weren't open for months to offer it, they didn't have that measure anymore. So everything else becomes of more importance. So like right now in the month of December, just this week, I've probably spoke with um, 14 different schools. We're making, I'm making advocacy calls for our, a lot of our early applicants, early decision and early action. You'll, you'll learn about those terms down the road. And we're talking a lot about scores. Um, we're talking about those factors. And I'm just like, I always slide in a question after I'm done talking about the student, you know, talk to me about scores, what you're seeing. And they're like, it's, it's, this is a no-brainer. If you don't submit scores, we're just looking at everything else more heavily. We're putting a lot of focus, as always, on the transcript. 
So the courses your student has taken, whether they've challenged themselves, their grade trends, and then everything else, the, you know, the college essay, the, the um, activities they've engaged in, the letters of recommendation. So yeah, well GPA is interesting because GPA is a calculated number. And to many colleges, that number is going to come in as one and become something else really quickly when they do a recalculation of it. So it, you'll hear, we'll talk about this more in junior year, GPA is not everything. Students get really hung up on their GPA. Yes, they set it freshman year. Yes, it's a number that represents how they're doing. But I have plenty of seniors I'm working with right now who don't have a quote unquote high GPA. They're good solid students that had some grade fluctuation, whether it was due to virtual learning, the pandemic, personal things going on, family matters. They're getting into great schools because they're explaining that through an essay. Their trend went back up. It might have been kind of kind of iffy ninth and 10th grade. Maybe they had a handful of Cs. Junior year, they brought it up, and they're on their way to straight A's at mid-year of senior year. But the GPA didn't move a lot. The GPA is just a number. Colleges are so much more focused on what you're doing to get to that number. So when you go test optional, it's everything else matters more. If you're not going to submit that, okay, then we're going to have to amp up everything else. All right, that was a lot of information. I thank you all so much for coming out. Those of you that tuned in at home, thank you so much. Questions we didn't get to, please reach out to your counselor. Thank you all so much.